I work with corporates, education sector, uh, I run private groups and I have clients here in Singapore and all around the world. So there's this kind of sweet irony going on for me here is that for the large part of my life I help people find themselves and here we are exploring getting lost. Very funny. So the other day I was in a taxi and I lost it. Running late for a race, a very small window to register, very snippy, tired taxi driver. I was stressed and we got completely lost. Driving around and around, doing U-turns, past the same tree about three or four times and I said, I think we're lost. And he said, we can't get lost, we're following the GPS. The GPS never gets lost, we're so not lost. I said, we're lost. And he said, I think you're losing it. And I said, look, who's lost their marbles, right? You're following a machine that's lost its connection. We're totally lost. There's that same tree again. And he said, I'm at a loss. The GPS never gets us lost. And I'm looking at my clock and my watch, and I said, I've lost the window to register for the race. The race is lost. All my training is lost. And he said, you're totally losing it. And he closed, he stopped the taxi. He said, get out, get lost. And off he drove, and as he drove away, I went, what a loser. <laughs> of course, that's an imaginary story. But the reason why I wanted to tell it to you is because I started thinking about how we use the word lost. And so often in our language and in our particularly slang vernacular, the way that we use words is very telling of a cultural mindset. And you can tell by that example of my snippy taxi driver, which didn't happen, that we largely use the word lost in reference to either insanity or insult. Isn't that interesting? But I think what the word lost is actually revealing to us is something much more fundamental, and that's what I want to talk with you about today. When we don't, when we've lost something, we don't have it. When we've lost at something, we haven't won. Having and winning. Our relationship with the word lost is revealing to us what I believe is an unconscious buy-in to a paradigm that life is one big race. It's a competition that can't be lost. We have this bad rap on lost. And this aversion to losing and being lost, and this addiction to winning and having, has us grappling with systemic overconsumption, environmental demise, and widespread stress-induced illness, depression, obesity, and cancer being the big three on the planet. So it appears that our obsession with the grand race of life and our aversion to getting lost isn't working so well for us. And here's the paradox of paradise lost. We are so focused on competing, on striving, on growing, on being productive, on winning, that we've actually lost connection with the true nature of ourselves and the true nature of life. We've lost connection with the wild fields of the earth. We've lost connection with the power of our present awareness. And I absolutely love this um, painting of William Blake. I mean, it's just gorgeous just looking at it, isn't it? So this is uh, William Blake's rendition of John Milton's 16th century poem, Paradise Lost. And if we can just sort of easily step through any biblical interpretations of what it is, let's have a look at what's going on here. So there's Eve, kind of mindlessly consuming the apple. There's a pretty buff looking Adam who's got his back to what's presently going on, and he seems a bit bedazzled, doesn't he? He's like, whoa, what's out there? What's in the past? What's in the future? And then perhaps almost accidentally, prophetically, Blake has uh, painted the tree of good and evil like showering digital code. 
And I think what Blake is capturing here and, uh, and in his rendition of Milton's Paradise Lost is actually archetypal. I think this picture, which is called The Fall, is capturing the invitation and the acceptance into the race. And of course, what was the promise of the serpent? To have it all, to have knowledge, to have power, to win. Absolutely beautiful. Often the classics always hold these gorgeous commentaries on the human condition and that's why they endure. There's an inherent rhythm in all of life. In nature, in our mind, body, energy system, in collective fields like markets and business cycles. And in that inherent rhythm, there's a growth and an expansion, a demise and a loss. It's how we're designed to operate. The winter precedes the spring. We have to exhale first before we have to inhale. Our hearts empty themselves of blood before they fill again for the next oxygenation of the cells. Trees lose their leaves to allow the roots to grow. The tide pulls out before it comes back in. There is, this is the pulse of life. This is what actually keeps us moving. And when we pull back from the grand race, and when we lose ourselves in the present moment, not only is it regenerative for our physiology, but it also allows our deep mind to integrate, to rest, and then to germinate, and then to gestate the new movement forward. The grand race which is amped up into toe-curling speed by the internet and 24-7 connectivity and constant streams of data has us totally stressed out. Our minds are dissipated. Harvard Medical School estimates that 42% of our waking day were not actually here. We're projecting into the future about what we haven't had, what we don't have, or what we need to do to win. Or we're tracking back to the past, again, tactically working out how we're tracking in the race. So nearly half our day, we're not here. So it appears, again, that our aversion to getting lost means that we've lost connection with the only reality window of our lives, the present. Of the 600,000 thoughts or so we have every day, 75% of them are eliciting a stress response in our bodies. So by not being mindful and by being so bought in to the grand race of life, we're stressing ourselves out. As it turns out, getting lost in the present and getting lost from the race and getting lost within the self is super good for us. So we know that when we pull back from all of the activity of the interface of our lives and we enter into presence, and we can do that through meditation, we can do that through any inner practice. If you're absorbed in a beautiful piece of music or a beautiful piece of art, or you're in a creative project that totally absorbs you, it's all the same sort of thing. When we pull back, we, our cells start to regenerate. We need to do it regularly, but our cells start to regenerate, our brains start to restructure, our immune function strengthens, our body chemistry balances. The body seems to love getting lost. When we let go of striving and having to have and needing and constant effort and force, and we come into a state of present awareness, that shift is marked from a move from beta to theta brainwaves. And in that shift, the part of our brain that allows us to gauge whether we're in the past, the present, or the future, 
goes into a state called temporary hypofrontality, which means it just switches off. The shift in the brain waves is also more predominant in the right hemisphere of the brain, which can't clock the passage of time. So when we enter states of meditation, our brain responds in a way and switches mechanisms to allow a deeper lose. And all of these, I mean, we need, that's just the brain. The brain loves getting lost. I mean, we'd need a couple more creative morning talks if we wanted to get into the heart's response and also the responses of the enteric and the central nervous system when we get lost. But what these physiological changes are telling us is that innate within our design is a requirement to get lost and get lost regularly. We are creative beings. I mean, you guys are here because you're part of a creative network, but it is the human nature. We are designed and we're impelled to create, to creatively express our truth and our talents. And when we don't, we get stuck and we stagnate and we get ill. And it turns out that getting lost is key to creative expression as well. So we know that all of the sort of writing and content on the creative mind talks about the necessity to uh, move from a, a, a movement of force and generation into allowance. The creative mind requires getting lost so it can germinate and gestate and allow to ripen whatever the creative idea is. I come from a very creative family. So I'm a writer, my mum's a painter, my younger brother is a film director and musician, my older brother creates these awesome civic experiences in retail property, and my sister uh, creates pathways for the voiceless. She advocates for the Australian government. We're all very creative. My ancestors' artwork is hanging in European galleries. And living in such a creative tribe means that there are mood swings sometimes that can tilt the planet on its axis. But what it has shown me, though, is the importance of getting lost in the creative process. So we have an understanding of that within my tribe. If one of us slips off the grid, we know they're, we know they're doing their thing. We know they're getting lost. And the psychologists agree. So this is a beautiful quote from Stanford University's Emma Sapana. The idea is to balance linear thinking, which requires intense focus, with creative thinking, which is born out of idleness. Switching between the two modes seems to be the optimal way to do good, inventive work. And what we find is the opposite is true. The more we regularly get lost to ourselves, lost from the race, lost into present awareness, the sharper our linear functions become. So we know that regular meditators have sharper recall, memory, fluid intelligence, pattern picking. We know that regular meditators are better able to switch between their left and right brain faculties to solve problems and to create. In other words, they're better able to bring their logical mind and their intuitive minds to the dance floor. And again, in Organised Mind, Daniel Levitin is talking about this when he says, artists recontextualise reality and offer visions that were previously invisible. Creativity engages the brain's daydreaming mode directly and stimulates a free flow and association of ideas, forging links between concepts and neural modes that might not otherwise be made. And I'm sure we've all had this experience. You know, when you've been cloud gazing or caught by a dazzling dawn and you've just had a moment where you've been lost before the race calls you back and you can feel the inspiration, you can feel power, you feel freedom, you feel awe, you feel good. And I've had a very personal experience 
experience of this in my home. So my 12-year-old daughter, last year, we were clashing heads on homework time. So she's very bright, she's very creative, uh, she's very opinionated, she's gorgeous. Anyway, we were having this trouble at homework time, so I'd come home from work and then she'd be with a homework out and she'd be drawing or listening to music or um, not doing homework. Well, that's what I thought. I was looking at her activity and going, she's totally swerving her homework. And we were really set to task on it. We were really banging heads. I was going, you can draw later, draw anything you want, listen to your music videos, get your homework done first, homework, homework, homework. And it wasn't working for her. She wasn't making the connections. She wasn't able to understand what she understood that day in the lesson. And we, we weren't, we was pretty grisly around homework time. And so I thought, ask the teachers. The teachers aren't onto this. So I spoke to the teachers. No, no, she's good. She's perfectly capable. Let her do a thing. Being a sly tiger mum, that was a bit hard for me. And so, but I did. What, what made us find a new mode was the clashing. And so in the middle of last year, I said to her, um, okay, I'm gonna get off your back. I'm just gonna let you do it your way, but here's the deal. If you're late on your homework, or if your grades drop, we need to find another way. And she agreed. And so it was easy for her, but I'd get home from work and there'd be an intricate eyeball being drawn on her maths homework, and I'd be like, and I promised not to say anything. Occasionally, if I was really worried, I'd go, oh, good. She'd go, yep, oh, good. But what she had an instinct for is what we're talking about, that for her, she had to release from the linear, structured, forced approach and draw an eyeball for the connections to be made. All of the homework went in on time, at the end of last year, she took out an academic award for her year and she was moved to the highest classes in maths, English and Chinese. She knew that she needed to get lost to allow the connections to be made. And I think that instinct of how a mind works is pretty impressive and very beautiful as well. So this is a photograph of her maths workbook. Every tiger mum's nightmare. <laughs> but I think for me, and certainly in my life and what I have observed and what I teach, is that regularly getting lost allows us to lean into a much more expanded field of sensory perception. And when we do this, we start to access our intuition as, a, as the key guiding force in our lives. So apart from teaching meditation and doing work in corporates and all that kind of jazz, I'm also an intuitive healer and I also teach courses in transformational practices, I guess, to live intuitively. So when I'm saying that, it's not some kind of spooky, magic, exclusive thing. It's teachable and we're all designed <laughs> to operate this way. So, for example, I would see between, uh, depending on what else I've got on, but up to about 20 people a week for a private session, and maybe about five remote sessions with clients overseas. And when I put my hands on them in the session, I can see or taste an addiction, which is causing the leeching of their life force and the exhaustion that they're experiencing. I can feel the terror of a childhood trauma that's been denied, which is resulting in uh, their autoimmune disease problems. I can feel the guilt of a hidden abortion as a teenager, which is uh, resulting in a tumour growing. Now, it's very specific, and it's very useful. And so some people go, it's psychic, but I don't like that term, because I think that's a term that comes from the race. If you're psychic, it's an exclusive skill, when I don't think it is. I prefer shamanic terms for this kind of leaning into broader fields of information and energy which are available to us. 
In shamanism, it's called the strong eye. And the word shaman is a Siberian word that means one who sees in the dark. One who knows how to get lost like a pro. <laughs> and uh, this is the way we're supposed to roll. So getting lost regularly opens up this field of awareness. That's my, that's my point here. So here are my top tips for getting lost like a pro. Wherever possible, consciously disrupt your patterned behaviours in the race. Smile first. Give rather than take. Perfect your pause. And that's the point of mindfulness practice, right? So you, you generate a pause point between your interface with reality and how you're going to respond. Digital detox, I mean, everyone talks about it, but I love how they like post about how they're on a digital detox. <laughs> so I'm on a digital detox, everybody in the world. But we can do that in small ways, right? So we can, you know, you're going to go down to a cafe, take a book, just leave your phone. And it's amazing how many times you go to check your phone and you go, I haven't got my phone. And then finally you realise you're in the race, right? So just leave your phone. Um, I used to do this thing with the kids called Upside Down Days. Was, I still want to do it, but now they're teenagers. They're like, oh, I'm getting away, it's so daggy. But we used to do, first day of holidays, we did Upside Down Days. So we ate dinner for breakfast. We wore our pyjamas during the day. We had breakfast for dinner. We got dressed for bed. We totally flipped the structure and the momentum of the school term on its head with an upside down day. I still love it, but anyway. Um, the plan is to have no plan. All right, so this is something my husband used to say to me when we first got together in London. And we both um, had really busy corporate jobs and we travelled a lot. So when we had a weekend together, it was, uh, it was kind of precious. And I'd be up in the morning, I'd go, what's the plan? We need a plan, let's do a plan. And he endured this for a few months. And then he turned to me one day and he said, the plan today is we're not going to have a plan. Okay, cool, I can do that, that's a plan. <laughs> and so that began the most beautiful courtship of getting lost. We would meander the canals of Camden, we'd hang out in the back streets of Portobello Markets, we'd find some random pub that we didn't even know was there, we'd have a beautiful meal, there'd be an Irish guy playing a violin. We got lost in each other by getting lost. And still today, 20 years later, he's very intelligent, my husband, that's why he's a keeper. So 20 years later, we still wake up on the weekend and go, no plan, no plan. Meditate, 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 meditate. Not to win, not to have the skill, not to be in the race. Meditation is not the end game. You know, the race is really leaning in on all of these beautiful ancient practices now. It's not about winning with meditation. Meditation enables a, a move into present awareness. Meditation enables getting lost in yourself, just for a spell. If you do it regularly, you start to generate an inner space. And it doesn't have to be a lot daily, but just 10 minutes a day establish the habit and then you've got some space to lean into those wider fields of sensory perception. Move your body. So you guys would have all heard of the um, beautiful state of flow that creatives and athletes talk about and with rhythmic, uh, more energetic um, exercise like running or swimming where there's a rhythm to it, there's a synchronisation that happens within the brain, the frontal brain and the, the uh, subcortex as well. And you get lost. You get lost from the technique, you get lost from winning in the goal and you hit your stride in this beautiful, I think they call it the zone, don't they, the zone. Moving your body helps you get lost. And creative expression, which I don't really need to wax, <coughs> excuse me, wax lyrical here in a room full of creatives, but what creative expression really gives you is a steep into the senses. 
Don't write to win the Pulitzer Prize. And don't draw to be hung at the Guggenheim. Do it because it absorbs you in a beautiful, different form of expression. Movement, absorption in sound, uh, using sense, getting out in the wilderness, all of these are forms of creative expression that steep you into the senses, and the senses are portals to getting lost. Escape to uncharted lands. Now, of course, we can do this on the weekend. Pick a place on the island that you've never been and just get there without a plan and meander around and see what you can find. Really, really fun. And you meet some amazing people and have these beautiful experiences. We probably all did this. I was going to say we all did this in our 20s, but you all look like you're 20. <laughs> but when I was travelling in my 20s, it was pre-internet, right? So we didn't have any Google Maps or any of that stuff. And so part of travelling was just to absolutely get lost and just see what happened. And those were the days that were the best. Turn left, maybe right, have a cup of tea with that old lady sitting on the doorstep pick up a name of something else, go there, and just intuitively navigate your way around. And uh, uh, now I know travel is hard. I make a point every single year of going to an ancient, spooky, magical place. So I'm an expert in getting lost in stone circles, megalithic structures, Egyptian tombs, the Amazon rainforest. Every year I go by myself or with one other loser. <laughs> and my girlfriend, Kate. And, uh, uh, that, that absolutely, I come back totally replenished with new ideas and inspiration. Even if it takes a little while to cook up, it comes out eventually. So I know travel's not easy for everybody, but I would definitely recommend some form of regular retreat. Pull back and out of your normal space, your normal environment, and retreat. Just for a spell on three days will do it and you'll start to feel the benefits of getting lost. And so that's my take on the beautiful art of getting lost. And so with great gratitude and respect, I, I wish you will all just go and get lost. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave.